Yeah, welcome back. Chris. Hey, what's up? Nothing. What's up with you? I should say life. That's what I tell all the players. Life. Okay. Um, James Rashad situation. Um, the impact of that in the spring and the quarterback situation. Yeah, you know, he'll be out until we think he's in a good space to get back. Uh, and hopefully by the end of spring ball, he's taking some seven on seven reps and some non team reps, but still, you know, dipping his toe in the water. And stuff like that. Um, what's your thoughts about the perfect situation we're all going in spring ball? Yeah, I mean, it's good. I think we're going to have a good competition in spring. Uh, I think adding Sam to the room, having Navi to the room, uh, adds, you know, pretty good depth there. And uh, I think putting in a new system. And we've been able to get a bunch of walkthroughs in uh, leading up to spring ball. And now we'll be able to get spring ball reps with three guys taking reps and then you know Jaden adding back in there'll be a plethora of reps for these guys so when we leave spring ball these guys are going to have a really good grasp of the system and uh, what we're trying to get accomplished you said new system so how much of this is you how much is Marcus yeah I would say it's about 60 40 70 30 the verbiage and everything from last year obviously having to change signals uh, you know once you get signals on on tape people are going to steal your signals. So having to change the signals, change some of the, you know, the verbiage of you may have called one thing cat last year, and now you call it tiger, uh, you know, some stuff like that. Uh, but other than that, I would say 60, 40, 70, 30, somewhere in there. Uh, you'll definitely see more under center, more shifts, more motions, some, some more of that world, which we kind of did at the end of last year. So some of that stuff that we kind of did at the last year, you'll see that more built into what we do as opposed to a reaction to a situation we're in. It'll be more, a little bit more of kind of what we do and what we build things around uh, this year. Hi, Kenny. Hi, how you doing? Good. We talked about lack of depth last year. It was apparent at a lot of positions you needed more depth. So as you go into spring ball, what areas do you think you have the most depth what areas do you think you might still need a body? Yeah, most depth, O-line, uh, D-line, safety, wide receiver. May need a body or two, running back, tight end, linebacker, potentially, depending on how healthy people stay, how people develop, and what we see. And Coach, obviously with uh, Alfred and Jason, you sense more, obviously, excited for them. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at, we signed four guys last year that I felt were really plus players uh, that didn't play. And those guys aren't really talked about. I mean, you mentioned two of them. The other two are Jordan Tyson and Ben Coleman. You know, those are four really, really good football players that technically we just signed from the transfer portal uh, that are only going to play from this year. So you kind of added four bonus players to your roster that people aren't going to talk about that are pretty good players. I think it's exciting to get those four guys back and really, you know, Jordan played at the end of the year, but it was just to get him over the knee injury. You got to get live reps and do it. So it was more just to get him over that mentally. That way, going into the offseason, he felt like, okay, everything medically is good. I've played in a game. I've tweaked it in a game, and it, it made me scared. Part of it, you're fine. Now you can go into the offseason and really know you're fine. So that was all part of the plan with Jordan, even when we signed him, was we weren't, we weren't going to rush you. We kind of knew three of those guys weren't even going to play last year, kind of banking on them to play this year. So, Kenny, obviously, just like last year, first time as a head coach uh, in spring practice, a lot of it is just really devoted, I'm, I'm assuming, to instilling the culture, really having the players understand you, uh, you understanding the players. Um, even though there's a good core coming back, I mean, again, it's a pretty big uh, transfer class, do you feel those are really um, a lot of similarity as far as your approach with the spring practice uh, I think we're further along from uh, what the minimum standard is. You know, when you get to a place, you're not going to set the high standard. You can try to set a high standard, but the reality is what is the minimum standard you're going to allow? And is the minimum standard reachable for your guys? Because you can't set a minimum standard that 40% of your guys are going to fail at. You want to have a football team. Right, so you have to be able to manage what minimum standard can our guys reach. I would say this year the minimum standard that we can reach is, is much higher than the minimum standard that we could reach last year. So that's the bar we set. Uh, and everybody knows uh, we want to go out there and compete every day. That, that's just the 
who we are. That's who I am. That's who this team's always going to be is we're going to compete and be fiery. And if we don't bring en energy, we're going to start something over. Like there's only one way you do things and that's all in. Uh, that'll be from now till forever. Yeah, I think there. I think there's a few. I mean, I think uh, it'd be hard for me to name one or two. I know Jacob is one that just he brings a, a lot of juice. Uh, Cole Martin's another guy who brings a lot of juice. But but there's. I mean, Sam Levitt is a guy who brings a lot of juice. I mean, there's a there's a few. We we recruited. I mean, Watley is a guy who brings a lot of juice. I mean, that was part of what I believe. I firmly believe you're either a multiplier or a divider. You either are around somebody and you multiply what they can accomplish and you make them better or you make them worse. I don't believe there's people that just make somebody around them the same. Uh, I think the energy you give off, the work ethic that you produce is either gonna make the person around you multiply or divide and we recruited the people who multiply, not people to divide. And that was strategic and I think you can kind of see that in our workouts is you're seeing people feed off one another. Yeah, I think we're going to be able to do more. You know, in year one, when you're banged up like uh, we were, you can't, you can't do a lot. And that's not a good situation uh, when teams can run the ball, but you don't have enough depth to be able or enough, you know, system knowledge to be able to change up looks like you want to. That's a horrible combination. Uh, so I think this year you're going to be able to see us do more creative things on base downs. You know, third downs has always been the baby. We're, uh, we run a pro-style defense here, middle closed, two of the core, four down, get after the quarterback. That's a pro-style defense to, to its core. Well, we have to be able to now disguise the, those looks on base downs better, just like we do on third downs at a pretty good level. We have to be able to do that on base downs uh, to protect our calls. And that's where year two, year three, year four in a system uh, only gets better at those little things that most people won't see. I'm a stacked 30 linebacker versus stacked versus a 10 linebacker with a three technique in front of me. The minor changes of disguises that don't look right to a quarterback that actually give up what you're about to be in. Why are you a three with a 30 stacked? Nobody plays defense like that. Somebody's about to move. Like that disguise doesn't make sense, but those are the disguises in year one when you, when you can't teach it and show it and kids don't know it like the back of their hand that you're showing sometimes and you're like, man, we can be better at these in year two, year three, and that's not just defense, that's offense, that's special team, that's all phases. Where do you put your L1 on a kickoff team? Do you put them as way out on the hash this year or way out on the sideline this year to disguise it? Do you put them in an L5 position and then let them contain? All the disguises and things that change up looks can now take that step because the core of our roster knows the fundamentals of what we're doing. Hey, Kenny, um, just kind of based off the leadership we talked about last year, offensively, to have a group, how do you kind of see that develop over the offseason? What are your kind of expectations that you can Yeah, I think that'll, right now, I mean, it's hard. It's strength, it's conditioning, it's that stuff. We try to put them in adverse situations. And guys like Leaf, you know, are guys who can step up for us. But that really shows up when we get out on the football field. That shows up when we go four straight series and we go three and out. Like, is it silent? Is it not? Who steps up? Who says, give me the rock? Who says, throw me the ball? He said, who says, run GT counter behind me? I want to pull. Like, what guys have that juice about them that they want the pressure when things are going poorly? And uh, so you, it's, hard, it's harder until you get to fall or spring ball, until you face the football adversity uh, because right now some kids are really good at training that they aren't as good at football. And some kids are really good at football that aren't as good at training. And you got to make sure the leaders of your team are the football players, the ones that are going to be out there on Saturday. Coach, what did you learn one full year of being a coach with the transfer portal, especially about retaining players and how easier Honesty. Like, you better be brutally honest with dudes. Uh, it's what I've always believed in, but it's definitely what I've learned is – you only want the kids in your team who want to be here. You don't even convince a kid to stay. I, I don't have conversations trying to convince kids to stay. I say, congratulations, I'm rooting for you. 
but it's a privilege to be here. And I don't care what changes in college football, these are still guys that are in college football living out their dream, right? It is a privilege. They are living literally what they dreamt about when they were eight years old, seven years old. That is still a privilege and you better respect that. And I want people in this program who love this, want to be here with a passion every single day. Yeah, I mean, I really think the detail, you saw him get become a more detailed coach throughout the year. In my opinion, when you're a head high school coach, you're managing a program of 160 kids, potentially 130 kids from your varsity team to your freshman team, right? Now you come here and you have five. So it's a completely different level. The levels of importance are completely different, right? The most important thing to you now is what is the first step of my tight end on zone? Which, when you're a head high school coach, that's probably like 37 on your list, is what's the tight end's first step on zone. So I think you saw him transition his focus to very narrow-minded, and then you saw him learn a little bit of the recruiting landscape and kind of navigate that from the other side. And uh, when you're a head high school coach, you see one side, and it's great. And you learn it, and you get on this side, and you start to learn the other side of it. And I think, you know, over the last six months, seven months, he kind of put together both sides of it. Uh, and I think he's become a better recruiter from that standpoint as well. Super fired up we have him here. And he's a Sun Devil. What area maybe feels the most different for you compared to this time a year ago? I would just say team culture. Like last year, we, we get – every day we get basically a list of who was late to tutor, who missed, a school, who missed a class, who was late to weigh-ins, who was late to meal, if somebody was late to a meeting or a practice, if you were way to, uh, late to weightlifting. Last year, it was like, whoo, nobody's on the list. This year, it's, why the heck is that person on the list? So like that, I would say, is the biggest change is something as simple of the minimum standard. That list is a minimum standard list. Nobody should ever be on the list. But last year it wasn't. Last year having nobody on the list was like success. This year having one person on the list is failure. That's where I say the minimum standard is just so much higher for how our guys are operating day to day. We get a photo of the locker room every single night. The locker room, the players lounge, and if there's one thing out, right, there's repercussions for it. You don't have things out. It's just the minimum standard is raised, and the goal is you slowly raise the minimum standard because the minimum standard is the valley of what your program is going to be in a down year. So the whole goal is to get your minimum standard so high that when you have a down year, wow, people still think you're pretty good because you can't possibly dip below it. And that's what we're really trying to raise, in my opinion, as everybody talks about success. I want to create what is, our, what is the minimum standard of the program and how high can we push that. And that's going to re measure how good we can be, is our worst people. Are you expecting the other players not to be available? Uh, X won't be available uh, just with the foot surgery from last year. Bram uh, won't be available. Other than that, uh, everybody else, you know, there may be a few other guys, depending on like some muscular things in and out. But those are the only guys from last year carry over. Uh, Emmett will be back full go. Everybody else should be pretty much full go. But wouldn't Jake, as long as he goes through, not have the fight Yeah. You know, if things go smooth, we would hope, you know, we can get him to do some seven-ons or some, some indie work. Uh, the thing that's nice is we do some walk-through periods, uh, you know, versus a defense and versus looks that he's going to, he gets to stand back there and take those mental reps over and over again. Uh, we changed our team room into a pretty much a video wall. So instead of it being a screen, it's a life-size wall, a 30-yard essentially wall. And we film with a 180 camera now right behind the quarterback. That way the quarterback can step up there and almost see life-size reps. We do, so we can flip it over and film it from the linebacker spot and he can read guard to back keys from that same life-size person view. So we've done some stuff 
uh, that I've had in the past that I felt were really productive to teaching tools. At the end of the day, we're teachers. And uh, you know, this is, if you look at us on campus, uh, you know, we have a, we teach in 360 on campus. We teach biology classes in 360. Literally 100% immersive environment we're teaching right now. I'm trying to bring a little bit of that. I don't really like the goggles because they're hard to teach. In my opinion, they're difficult to teach a room off of. One person has them on, the others don't. One person's moving, the others see his head move. But getting a screen that's almost life-size allows everybody to look at it and almost feel like they're in it, not completely 360, but you can almost feel like you're in it. Some, some schools do it. It's really not uh, advanced technology. Everybody has different ways of how they learn. Uh, the 360 stuff in the VR is great. Uh, it's really, really good for one-on-one -on -one learning. You know, if you're coming up there by, by yourself, but when you're in a, a teach setting, I like having life-size pictures that multiple people can see. Nothing right, wrong, one side or another. I know there's some science behind VR and things entering your spatial awareness and that's way more productive. So I'm not a scientist, it's just more from a teaching perspective. This allows us to teach in a meeting room setting just like we always would, but we get a life-size picture in which we can almost do a walkthrough, take a drop and throw a ball against a wall that's 30 yards long from sideline to sideline. So it's very close to a field. You have to move your head to see a corner. I'm a linebacker and it's flipped. I can take two steps when I see guard pull. Right, so I can see life-size pictures move. So it's almost like a walk-through room. And yeah, there's some teams around the country with it. Something that I've kind of wanted. Um, last year was just, we had enough stuff going on. That was similar to what Coach Mon said, that wasn't like number three on my list of things we needed to get accomplished. Kenny, obviously you finished your first year. Um, as you self-evaluate, go back over last year, what, did you see go back and evaluate as things you wanted to yeah, I want to have more unified language, uh, which means offense, defense, special teams. At the end of the day, f body movements are body movements. I'm running, I'm decelerating, right? I'm breaking down, I'm tackling. Well, if I'm tackling or I'm stock blocking, I'm still getting into what we call now a power position, which is like you're squatting. If I'm running, I'm getting in a speed position. I'm running. I'm in a wide receiver stance. I'm in a speed position. I'm square as a DB. I'm in a power position. And all football is is transitioning from speed positions, running, to power positions. Uh, and then do that with great angles. So one thing that we did that we I tried to implement last year and absolutely failed was a unified language uh, from a just pure fundamental standpoint, offense, defense, the special teams. That language didn't get spoke how I wanted it to get spoke. Uh, this year, uh, it's going to. We've had, I've harped a lot more this year. We've had a lot more time as a staff, not doing as much scheme, but really focusing on the fundamentals. So we're gonna have some common language and some common themes that offense, defense, and special teams will all be able to coach us off of, which will make our special teams better, which will make our teaching simpler. And it'll, it'll allow a linebacker coach to teach a wide out uh, something on punt return. Uh, without there being a disconnect in teaching, which creates efficiency. So I'd say that'd be my number one thing I, w I failed at last year and I want to do better at is that unified language. Yeah, I think you learn. I mean, I learned you can't be scared to change if it's what you have to do and you can't fit a square peg into a round hole, so you gotta figure out what pieces you have, and it doesn't matter what offense you ran in the past, what are you gonna do you know, in the future? It's funny you actually bring that up. I was recruiting an old lineman who told me that another school told him that, oh, you're just gonna go there and run the swinging gate. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Is that what we're resorting to now? You really think I came to Arizona State to run the swinging gate? Like, come on, look at my history of offense. Right, I've been a top five offense three times. And we're talking about that. It was just funny you brought that up because I was like, really? That's, that's what we've resorted to now? Yeah, we're the official swinging gate offense. That's what we're going to base out of. So everybody get your mind right, right? But uh, it definitely learned that you, there's a lot of different ways to be successful. The game's pretty simple. There's 11 people on both sides of the ball. And the whole goal is to get your guy, hopefully on nobody. 
And if you face a team that won't let you get your guy on nobody, get your best player on whoever their worst player can be and repeat. And regardless of how you do it, whether you line up in the swinging gate or whether you line up in unbalanced or whether you go so fast that you hope you get a one on none because the defense bust, so many ways to do it, you better adapt what you do around your entire football team, your offense and your defense uh, in order to put them in the best position to be successful. Hey. Yeah, obviously we have the depth on both lines this year that we should be able to get after it a little more in live settings. You know, the most frustrating part about last season was when we hit week two, we couldn't practice. So we didn't get better. We got worse. And I think I said that in my end of the year presser was, you know, I think we were better at the end, at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, after our break, after our uh, bye week, than we were at the end of the year because we were practicing hard. Once we had injuries, we could no longer practice. We didn't hit. We only have six alignment, and then you had to put others on scout. You can't practice. And at the end of the day, you have to practice to get better. It's, it's very simple. Like, if you don't practice anything, you're not going to get better. If you want to tackle better, you have to tackle. If you want to get open, you have to run routes versus a DB. You can do all your cone drills, you can do all that stuff you want, but at the end of the day, you have to go do it in a real football setting in order to get better at it. And uh, we couldn't do that at the end of last year. And that's the part of last year that irks me the most is that development piece for a lot of the guys that needed it. We couldn't do it in order to just stay healthy enough to field a team. I, I hopefully knock on wood, hopefully there's wood under this deal that uh, we uh, don't face that issue this year and that we'll continue to be a team that gets better throughout spring, throughout summer, throughout fall camp, throughout week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever that is. Hopefully we get better and not worse because of that. Oh, yeah. He'll get a bunch. You know, Navi's two-time state champ now. You know, two-time Gatorade player of the year, two-time state champ. When I mean, we were in a walkthrough the other day, it's a walkthrough. And, like, he's over there pulling pulling runs, showing people that he can run. Navi's, Navi's a huge asset to the program. I am super happy we have him. He's also probably the best Madden player on the team. So you can throw out that. That'll make him, you know, the, the king of controversy here. You know, our team has a little Madden league. They have. I'm trying to get them to put it on, like, what is it called, like Twitch or something so people can watch our players compete in the Madden League, maybe get some fans involved, some former players, uh, to, you know, make it fun. But, uh, yeah, they always talk about their Madden League down there. Who gets the most competitive when you guys are that like that? Oh, Jordan Tyson. Oh, yeah, Jordan Tyson. Yeah, Jordan Tyson is definitely, uh, I, I wouldn't say the most, he, he's the, he's, yeah, he's the most, you know, emotional when I beat him. He does have the lead on me, though, so I can't say too much. He's got me beat right now. We've talked periodically, Kenny, about the NIL situation. Can you kind of talk about where you guys are with that now and how much progress you've seen from last year? Yeah, I mean, the progress we've seen is unbelievable, to be honest. From the last game to today is, and I can't even put in words how much growth we've had. Uh, and I think that's you'll see that this year is that growth. Now, the difference is everybody's growing. That's the challenge. And so right when you catch up, right, you're still behind because you caught up. So we have to, we have to move at a faster pace than everybody else because we started right behind the race. So, yes, are we catching up and are we probably trending faster than most people? Yes. But as we're going and hitting numbers and hitting goals, other people are still inching further and further ahead of us because – to be honest, we started way further behind. But we are definitely in the right direction. I think people are starting to get, they're starting to understand the importance of it and understand that uh, it is it is college football and it's needed. And college football now more than it's ever been is a group effort to win. I mean, you can't just complain. 
anymore. You used to just be able to complain and say, it's this guy's fault. Fire that guy, fire this guy and this guy. And you're like the, you know, you sit on your couch, you tell everybody what to do. Now you can't. You can either help find the solution or you're part of the problem. Very simple. If you're complaining on Twitter, part of the problem. Beautiful, don't really care, right? If you're finding a way to help, part of the solution. If you post something negative on Twitter, we may not get a kid because of you. You post something positive about a kid, we may get them. So are you part of the problem or part of the solution? And everybody's a picture and a piece of it now. More than ever in college football, kids are affected by the random dude on social media. They're affected by these little things that go off. So the fan base, the community, the, the, what we push out is important as a whole. And that's from the fan who comes to one game to the fan who watches TV. What we push out of where the program is going, everybody has an effect. And that's why there's those fake accounts that have like two followers that post all the negative stuff. Everybody knows those people are fake, right? It's the real people, right, that we got to get everybody po pointing in the same direction. So when people look on social media about us, when they look at NIL about us, everything is trending forward. Everything is trending up. And if we can get to that point, you're going to see local kids start to be like, man, why not? Why not a issue? And that's the first step of the process. Yeah, I want them to succeed. Like, I, I really, I am not a vindictive person. Like, I, I don't, some people, they leave a job, they want their old job to suck so people can say how great they were, right? That's like, <laughs> that's just how it is, right? Some of y'all, that may be somebody in this room, like, oh man, I hope that person's article sucks, <laughs> right? Because then I look better, right? I'm not like that at all. Like, I am purely, I'm focused on us. So if somebody leaves, I hope they go and kill it and have a ton of success. But I also hope we kill it and have a ton of success. Like, I don't need to see one person fail or one person down to be successful. Those are completely different things. So to me, it's, it's go succeed. Go do it. If you think that's best for you, do it. Kill it. I'm rooting for you. But I'm still going to do the exact same thing I planned on doing here. You're just not going to be a part of it. And may you miss out on it. I mean, is it, would it be, is it something you could miss out on? Yeah but you made a decision, I'm rooting for you. Go enjoy it, go succeed. And I'm still gonna worry about us. I'm not gonna get drawn up into the uh, drama of other things, other people, other places. None of that stuff matters to me. I would say just tendencies, uh, personnel groupings, Defensive systems, you know, we didn't face. There wasn't one team in the Pac-12 that ran, you know, the 3-3-5, I call it the monster defense with the split backers and the one monster at 10 yards. There wasn't one team. It's not really the Rocky. It's not, everybody says, oh, it's the Rocky Long system and it was one of the best coaches, in my opinion, in college football over the last 15 years, but that's another point. It is a completely different system that kind of Iowa State brought into the Big 12 and it kind of spread. And now there's four teams in that league that run it. So we face that system two, maybe three times, depending on what one of the teams do uh, with the new coordinator. That's something we have to prepare for. We're going to face more in this league odd five techniques than we will traditional Pittsburgh Steeler odd four eyes <laughs> with, a, with a jack backer that turns into an underfront, which was the traditional odd. Odd front. Shift the line, three by one, under. Beautiful. We won't face a lot of that in this league. So we're putting in installs, and what do you always do for the last 20 years, 15 years, it was four down, over, under, odd, jack back or pressed. Why? Not anymore. Now the third thing we gotta go versus what? Odd, five, split backers, one monster, break it versus three by one. Our kids have to see that, because we're gonna face it more than the other. Defensively, it's 12 personnel open sets. This league will be filled with 12 personnel open sets. We've got to find a way, how do we want to play 12 personnel? How do we want to play those sets when they open them up with two tight ends but they get into 10 personnel people? How are we going to play those sets? What's our plan? We need to practice that more leading up to it. So I'd say not just the recruiting, but 
a little bit of how you structure practice and plan practice, we have to, that has to be our base now because we're going to see it more. Uh, I mean, to be honest, hard without pads on uh, with the, with the O-line. You know, I think we've added a lot, of, a lot of depth there, but I think it's hard for me to, like, pigeon toe or put people in certain spots. I think we, like I said, I think we have a lot of depth. Uh, who can take that information, process it, apply it, and then knock people down, right, is, you know, what I'm looking forward to see. So... Two more weeks, I think I'll be able to answer that question a little bit better. Three more weeks. I know Sean mentioned that you approached him kind of, you know, after the season and identified him as a potential guy to step up in a leadership role. What have you seen from him? I know he's like captaining one of the offseason competition teams and his growth in that area. Awesome. I mean, Sean's a, Sean's a natural leader. People are attracted to him. Like, people look at him, and he naturally draws people to him, uh, and he's not scared to speak up. So I think any time that you are, have that natural ability that people are drawn to you and you're not scared to speak up and you're 18, 19 years old, you know, our program is we put now after year one, we'll put 10 people in a leadership council, two, three to four of those guys will be underclassmen so they can sit in in their meetings and they can kind of learn how to lead from the older classmen. That way they're in it. That way we are building leaders and building people uh, to become the future leaders of the team two, three years down the road. So we're never at a point, hopefully, that we're like, man, who are the guys? We're trying to train those guys and put them in positions to lead and make decisions. And he's one of those guys that I selected uh, to add to the leadership council to get to 10. Our team will vote after spring ball who the leadership council is. After the season ends, I'll get us back to 10 with who I think should deserve to be on it. Uh, but after spring, our team will vote for a brand new council.